Hello, everyone. Thank you very much. Um, these are the masochists, apparently, because at the end of the day, you've turned up to see a person chat about security in Power BI. Kind of probably the driest session I've ever done. But thanks a million for turning up. It's brilliant. Um, my name's Mark. Um, I guess the main thing I'd say about myself is I've been working with Microsoft Data Technologies for what feels like an awful long time, back in 1999 on SQL 7. Kind of specialized pretty early in what was called OLAP services, which became analysis services now, and then multi-dimensional, and then tabular, and is now moving into Power BI. So a lot of kind of time building a lot of solutions on analytical engines. And security is always there, right? It's always hanging in the background. So this talk is very much kind of about the questions I get asked a lot when I go in and meet clients, particularly public sector clients. They ask an awful lot of questions that you just wouldn't have thought of in there. So really what I'm just trying to address is kind of some of the conversation points that pop up and you know, what my view of, of them is. So hopefully you'll all pick up a couple of tips and said, appreciate you being here. What we're going to talk about today. Um, oh, by the way, to anyone online, hello. <laughs> um, what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about one, the Power BI administrator, because we need to know who's the Mac Daddy of Power BI in there, all right? So let's talk a little bit of that person. We're going to talk about tenant settings and the, important of the importance of your tenant settings and knowing what's going on in there. There's some, frankly, dodgy stuff, particularly if you're public sector, okay? Um, data gateways and connections, we're going to talk a little bit about them. Amazing some of the questions you get asked about gateways when you set them up. Such a simple thing. Whew, boy, some of the questions. Then we're going to talk about secure in the workplace and the apps behind the workspace. If you're in just session earlier, we'll touch upon some of the same content in there. And finally, we're going to talk about securing the data model itself. So I've actually got quite a lot of stuff to get through, so I'm going to keep rattling on. First question, who is your administrator? Well, before you even get to the Power BI administrator, you actually got to think about who are your other administrators that you might have inside in your organization, all right? Because you might have an Office 365 administrator. I hope you do somewhere, all right? You're going to have a, a Azure administrators, uh, Active Directory administrators, and all of these guys actually need to cooperate with you as a Power BI administrator in there. Because the first thing you got to do is you got to ask your Office 365 administrator, can you make me a Power BI administrator, please, in there, all right? Um, even that dialogue, I had a meeting that probably took an hour to work out with one public sector client. Once you've got that going on, you can then have your Power BI administrator. But there's not just a Power BI administrator. There's the gateway administrator. What's the difference? There's a workspace administrator. What's the difference in there? And then they have to communicate back with maybe your Azure guys, maybe your Office 365 guys to make things work, particularly in large enterprise-wide organizations where they don't just, you know, dish out the, here, have the domain, domain administrator password and knock yourself out, buddy, all right? So yeah, one call out in here is, you have to have conversations, preferably earlier, with other administrators and work out ways of working between yourselves. Otherwise, you'll lead to little delays inside in your projects. Really, this kind of comes down to, can you set up Active Directory Azure groups for me, please? Okay, or Entra security groups for me. It's even better if they can mirror existing security groups that already exist inside in your organization, by the way, so it's not yet another group to be maintained, but maybe there's one in there. But really just identifying those and make sure you got the, the structures in place that you can kind of talk back and forth with your Azure admins to get things working in there. Once you're on the Power BI side of things, I like the Power BI admin being positioned as part of a data team as opposed to being seen as part of the overall admin area in there because they are kind of closer to your data projects going on there, closer to your data teams. The relationships are probably better managed in that front. And the type of things those admins have to be managing is reviewing your tenant settings, making sure they're safe. Maybe they're setting up the gateways for you, setting up connections or setting up ways that people can delegate setting up connections going on there. Uh, maybe they're assigning user access, doing it hopefully via security groups, and possibly involved in the actual creation of workspace in there as well. On the previous session, we had something going on about creating workspaces and having a process behind that whole thing in there and limiting down who can do it in there. So just from the admin side of things, there's a bit of thought, there's a bit of cooperation, there's a bit of thought needed in it. 
demo. I'm going to cheat in my demos, guys, because I've got a lot to cover. So the first few demos are going to be just me showing you screenshots, but they're largely just screenshots of URLs, so I don't think it's too much of a cheat. There will be a bit more hands-on demos later on, all right? So first of all, Office 365, just in case you've never seen it, if you go to that URL, search for Fabric, you will find the Fabric Administrator, and you gotta go into that Fabric Administrator, and you gotta go add user. That's hopefully, <laughs> I shouldn't say hopefully, that might be your only conversation you'll have with your Office 365 team, <laughs> okay? But that's definitely one that you need to have in there. The next thing in there, creation security groups to help you out later on. So you're going to go to your Zero Active Directory. I've set up a bunch of groups in here. They've all got talks sitting in front of them. You can get a little bit of an idea of what they might be doing. I've got an app group, a member group, an admin group, and an end user group in there. Some sort of segmentation of my users and my roles that I have. Um, from a Power BI side of things, having been made admin, you are going to be reviewing the tenant settings. Okay, and just to give you an example of one thing I mean in there, workspace settings, the ability for people to create workspaces is enabled by default for the entire organization. Welcome to chaos, okay? So we wanna kinda cut that down a little bit, but we also maybe don't want to make the admin the one doing it for everybody in there as well. So the compromise point might be, do you know what? We will set this up and we'll delegate it to a bunch of people who can actually be responsible for creating workspaces in there, okay? That's just one of about 120 tenant settings we're going to be reviewing, not in this session. <laughs> Gateways, so when we have a gateway in there, um, it sounds like such a simple thing, but when you go in looking at a gateway, um, there can be multiple gateways existing inside in your tenants to begin with, all right? And this is something I swear only appeared recently, but maybe it's been there all my life and I've just been an idiot, okay? But there's this tenant administration button when you first time you go in looking at your gateways, you'll only see gateways that you are an admin of. You don't see any other gateways that you're not admin of. But there is a tenant administration toggle, and if you toggle that, two wonderful things happen. First of all, you'll see all gateways. So you can see in here that whoever set up this gateway wasn't me. So now at least I can see there's another gateway sitting in my organization. And there's a second wonderful thing up in here called manage gateway installers. So who can actually set them up to begin with, you know? Um, I haven't tested out that manage gateway installers. If it's anything like another blog post that a guy you have to use a PowerShell thing for it, I think it's gonna work out that they can still install the gateway but they can't register the gateway. So it's essentially a dead duck sitting there, right? So yeah, um, the actual gateway in itself has got some kind of thoughts going on about what happens with it. We're gonna see more of gateways in a while. Um, oh yeah, sorry, from within here, you can manage your gateway installers, who can install your gateway, and also you can set up groups, and those groups are very, very important to kind of go, well, having created a gateway, who can now administer the gateway? You know, so I'm gonna assign that to my security admin team that it's not just one person has to do it, we can hand it up. So again, security groups right into the rescue. Tenant, know your environment. Um, Power BI has a lot of settings, a lot of defaults. I did a quick count, I think there's 120. Um, new ones appear from time to time. Fabric added a load of them. Uh, some defaults are quite frankly questionable. Who has got published the web enabled in their organization? Good, <laughs> okay. Um, it's amazing how many organizations have it enabled and there's nothing more fun than when you say to a senior person in their IT organization, do you realize anyone in your organization at the moment can publish your data right in the public, out in the web? Um, so yeah, some defaults are questionable. Some def so defaults will directly impact usability, the ability to create cross workspace reports, of which I'm gonna talk about a little bit more in a while, all right? The ability to turn on Excel Live or turn it off to turn off export to Excel. That would be a fun one to do in an organization, right? Um, so yeah, we gotta look at those. Some highlights, the ability to create workspaces across works, uh, models across workspaces, export to Excel, publish the web, and anything in preview or trial, because Microsoft love putting up preview, they love putting up trial, opt into paid feature, which is again, something you probably want to be really questioning in your organization. Do we really want people spinning up trial things, spinning up solutions that might depend on something that's in preview that's not out there yet, okay? So this is your governance things. These are your security points you gotta be watching in there. There's a few interesting ones in there, public internet access. One I've not actually played with in there, all right? The ability that you, can own, that you cannot connect to Power BI via a public internet. 
And that ties me into another thing in case anyone uses conditional access, you can apply conditional access rules to your Power BI environment in there. So I have one client in there and the only way you can get onto their Power BI service is you have to be VPN'd onto their network in there. It does not happen. So don't forget about the conditional access as a security point to start popping in here. Uh, public sector, be extra aware of this one. I base that upon the length of conversations I have with them versus private sector. Um, and user groups, again, are probably your secret weapon here of how do you manage that because you will be in the situation of it's not as simple as all organization of none over the organization. It's a case of individuals in the organization and let's do that by security group. Let's not put in the named individuals because they'll move role and that's not a good place to go. Okay. This is not a huge job. It's an important job, but it's not a huge job. A lot of the defaults are pretty harmless, pretty straightforward. There's only maybe 10 or 20 that you might need to have an interesting conversation on. Have the conversations, make the decision, set it, and then review it from time to time because new ones pop up from time to time. Demo on the tenant. Um, again, I'm going to cheat a little bit and just flash up in a couple of sections in there. Here's the URL that you would go to. Let's look at a few. Fabric paid. So there it is. It's enabled in my organization. But I could turn around and go, well, only for these specific user groups if I wanted to do it in there. But at the moment, anyone can spin up a fabric paid. Excel, already mentioned, the ability to export to Excel, the ability to have Excel in live mode up onto Power BI, enabled for my entire organization, which I would approve of. Publish the web. Uh, Absolute dynamite. I've enabled it for my entire organization. That's okay. My organization consists of me and one or two others. Okay. Um, but absolute dynamite for other organizations have in there and it's enabled by default. So dynamite, it's one I'm actually going to do a quick little demo on. Uh, I have a click in here. And this will bring you to a publicly accessible report that I created years ago. Um, when I was in, uh, involved in another event, apologies, event feedback, view on web, here is the report. This report is very, very harmless. There is nothing dangerous going on in here. Okay, so what if it's on the web? Who cares? Where we should care is, I go to incognito mode and I pull up this little search term and I've put that in there and I specifically go site.app.powerbi.com. Reject all, whatever you want in there. I get a Google whack. There's only one hit coming back in there in an incognito search and I can sit on that and there's my report. Google has found it, Google has crawled it, Google has indexed it and it's picked up in text that's inside in my report. Have fun doing it with your own company, <laughs> okay? I've done it with companies I've worked with and to be fair, I've never ever seen anything risky, but it's interesting. It's something going on there. If you want to put in terms like revenue, you get an awful lot of test junk, by the way. But there are organizations out there who have done this, and I kind of go, I don't think they should have. All right. So yeah, that's one to terrify your um, governance officer if you have one of them somewhere. All right, back onto here. Gateways and connections. A <clears throat> little bit more detail in this one, all right? I should have said at start, I'm largely talking about pro in Power BI. Um, specific premium things in there, I'm ignoring specific fabric, I'm ignoring in there. Most of the concepts apply to all of them in there anyway, all right? So why I bring it up in here is there's another way you can connect to on-premise using a VNet, but that's a premium feature, so I'm still talking about, about um, a, a, a gateway. So a gateway is a way that allows the Power BI service to connect with on-premise. Your security team will get worried when you start the conversation like that, okay? They're, going, they're connecting to where now? And what that actually means is typically a VM is created somewhere on your network. That's the first thing that happens. On that VM, you install the gateway service. It runs as a service on that VM. You then, from that VM, you then register it with the Power BI service and now a gateway appears in Power BI. So that's the way it works. It goes up, all right? And then having done that, I can now create connections in the Power BI service, which will connect to on-premise databases via the gateway. 
So when you have this conversation with security, I'm trying to say to them, this is just infrastructure. It's not a, I've opened up the world to go looking at my network in here, okay? It is just infrastructure. It doesn't connect to any on-premise data on its own, and it doesn't have any particular special levels of access to anything. But your particular security points they're probably going to be asking you about, and then you can answer back with is the VM itself, right? The VM is just a VM. It's just a server. The, your IT team, your network team, they can do whatever they want to do with that VM. They can lock down the IP range to the entire network if they want. So they've got a VM sitting on their network that can't connect to anything on your network. Then, on a case by case, you go and I need to connect to that Oracle Enterprise server over there, by the way. You'll go, right, we'll open up a firewall rule between our VM and that Oracle network server in there, and that's what happens in there. So all of these conversations that they would expect to have, you can have. It's just a VM sitting there, okay? Um, the user who installs the gateway, they'll be asking lots of questions. Yes, they got installed a gateway, which means yes, they got to get remote access onto the VM, which means yes, they're going to be local administrator on the box for the purpose that are doing it in there. But you can manage that, right? I mean, that's just something, yeah, we need it. You can knock it off then afterwards if you need. That user who typically installs the gateway is also probably the person who registers the gateway in the Power BI service. Okay, so that's how the first can go on there. That person does not need any particular rights in Power BI. They need to have a, uh, an account in your domain. So if I'm going on as mark at company.com, I need to actually have an account at mark.company.com to actually be registering it up in there. But I need no particular Power BI rights. Yes, I become a gateway administrator once I've done it because I've set up the gateway the first time in there. Which is why it probably makes sense to talk about maybe we limit who can set up our gateways to begin with and we just we know they're all admins by default in there, right? And then the other thing they'll have a conversation about is the service account of the gateway itself. It's just a standard vanilla service account that it sets up to run the service. The service connects to nothing, all right? When the connections are coming in, that's determined up in the Power BI cloud. The service is just going, I'm just running a service. I'm connecting nowhere, okay? Keeping on with the gateways, I've covered some of these already. Gateways are created by the user who registers, and they're the initial gateway admin. Um, gateways run as a service. The service account does not need any particular perm permissions. Service on the VM needs IP connectivity. Um, VM needs to have drivers to relevant sources. Just throwing that out there in case it pops up. For example, you create a gateway and it needs to connect to Oracle. You will have to install the Oracle drivers and, con and configure your TNS names, etc on that VM before it can actually go talk into your machine in there. So it's not quite a install it and forget about it. You will have from time to time go, oh, I may need to install things on it in there. You can have multiple gateways on one tenant. <coughs> That's fine. That makes sense maybe for production, test, UAT, et cetera, if you want to have separate ones. You can have gateways on your tenant that are coming from completely different domains which sounds a bit of a weird one, and will again terrify your security team in there. But you're back to that first principle of kind of going, well, yes, I have a client who actually does this for very genuine reasons, okay, that they needed to get data from a domain that they are not any way connected with, but they were just hosting stuff, and the solution was in there. They says, we're gonna put a gateway on that domain and register with ours. So going back to my simple, if I'm mark at company.com on my domain, I register with my tenant, but I can go to notmycompany.com, go in and there, log on as mark at notmycompany.com, but register it as markmycompany.com with the service, and it will appear, okay? There's some interesting use cases when you do that, because you can then combine data from across domains and side models in there. It's nothing to be scared of, but it is a conversation to maybe anticipate the questions you will get should the situation ever arise. Um, so yeah, if I, register, if I register a gateway, I could register another gateway from a different domain device that does not give me access. That does not give me automatic access. I suppose that's the key call out in there. The gateway does not give automatics to anything. It's just infrastructure. This brings us on to the connections. So your connections can source from cloud gateway or VNet, but we're talking about gateway here. Once a connection exists, you can link it to a data model, okay? assuming the user configuring has the rights to use that connection. So in the development process, I develop a model, and I'm in on-premise world, right? I'm in Power BI desktop, I've connected to my thins, I'm, you know, god of all my connections, all right? I publish to the service, and I hit my refresh, and it fails, 
and I'm gonna go, well, what's gone wrong, <laughs> okay? So what you have to do is you have to associate that Power BI model with a connection, all right? Now, in the absence of an obvious connection, they will get the connection created one way or the other in here, okay? So there's a, this is maybe more of a governance question that it's better to have fewer connections that many people can use rather than many connections that you're kind of going, who the hell is using all of these in there? But that then throws up a really interesting question, all right? So you can, you can use security groups, and we'll show that in a minute, to reduce connection sprawl. So by that, I mean we create a connection, I then assign that connection to a security group, and that security group then might be a build type of security group, and then your developer, who's a member of the build security group, can go, oh, publish my model, can see my connection, I can link up my model, happy days, no need to create a new data model. That, again, maybe public sector is a habit of doing this into me. Um, oh, there's a, there, you connections can use a variety of authentication methods. That's fine, that's just part of setting it up in there. This is a fun conversation I had with a client in there. So, if we have an enterprise data warehouse, but this sales model is just about sales, should my connection that I create only use a username and password that only allows that username and password to access sales? Okay, and I kind of going, well, that's fine, but what happens when you create purchases? What happens when you create logistics? What happens when you create all the other ones? Do you end up with multiple ones in there? If that's their decision, fine, but just then they have to appreciate the fact that they have more of these connections in there. And then you're trying to say, well, really, you can have that connection to your enterprise data warehouse with a quite a wide set of security. It doesn't overexpose any data because the data model itself is its own little security world of I just contain sales data. So just even though the refresh is using a bigger connection, for want of a better word, you don't magically open things up. It's another wonderful half hour, one hour conversation with public sector to convince them of this is actually okay in there. Okay? Let's talk about connection types in that example. Let's take John and Jane. John and Jane are, have got a model created for them in there. It's the standard import model going on over here. So someone's created an account service admin e enterprise data warehouse connecting to enterprise data warehouse. Okay, Here's where the security sits. Your end users over here, because this model is just about sales. The fact that this can see a lot more data is immaterial to this model. It doesn't overexpose anything in there. The same happens if we're in a direct query mode. If that direct query mode is set up with, again, all the queries are running under enterprise admin going onto my enterprise data warehouse, but the model itself has just got two tables in it from sales, they don't automatically get access to anything more in there. They just see what they have in it. Same in situation if you change, uh, if you set up direct query, uh, if you set up direct query in a Kerberos or a single sign-on, which I have not done, that's going to be a little bit of a different conversation, all right, because you're then kind of spreading your security across. There will be the security on who has access to the sales, but also the queries will be executing in the context of John and Jane when they hit the enterprise data warehouse. And the last one, which I've set up a lot, all right, this is in a situation where actually we're in live mode, we're going via connection and we're hitting an on-premise an analysis or tabular server. And what's going to happen in there is that's a admin connection, but it's going to use effective username to impersonate the person who's connected on there and pass in your security down. So in this case, your security is again kind of shared between here of who has access to the model, but down there in terms of uh, what do they actually see going on. Demo. Again, there's another little slide where a little bit of a demo in there because actually there's not much to see in the gateway itself. I mean, this is pretty much the gateway. We saw a shot of it earlier in there. I've got a few gateways set up. Um, what else can we have in here? If I look at a connection, oh, the things to call out about in here is notice my Surface laptop gateway, which is that machine just there, um, is got a security group in there of talks security admin. So I says, right, having created my user, which is me, I created it, so I am there as an admin, I can then assign other groups to that. I could then remove myself as admin, by the way, because I'm also in the security group. Uh, however, down here, I've got another one set up, which would be the same way. It's another one from another VM, and it's assigned to a security group. Down here in the connection, similar situation. Having created the connection, I am sharing that connection to a bunch of security groups. In this case, I've gone to my security admin team and also my security member team. So that bunch of people who are kind of going to give a slightly higher level of authority and that they can see and share this connection. 
And if you want to do that, basically, you're essentially clicking on manage users. Up or something like this will pop and you can kind of go right, add my user. And you can see in there, they're either a user or owner of the connections that are set up. Okay. So it's pretty straightforward to do in all of this, just some of the subtleties of the conversations underneath it. Workspace and workspace apps, 25, 20, I am three seconds behind time. <laughs> Got my own little ticker going on. Workspaces and workspace apps. So we talked a lot about infrastructure and tenant settings. So I suppose having gone through that as an admin, your role as Power BI administrator is probably done. I got a clean tenant, I got my security groups, I got my connections, I got, got my governance going in place. Over to you developers, all right? And then we'll start talking about what happens in the workspace. So let's talk about the workspace. The workspace has got four roles, you all probably know that. Four roles, admin, member, contributor, and viewer. Admin only applies to that workspace. So you can make a non-IT person the admin of a workspace, and that's not that dangerous, except they can delete the workspace, but you know, <laughs> we'll, hopefully they won't do that, all right? Um, you then got member and contributor, which are similar roles, okay? There's differences around some permissions and apps. There's a big list inside Microsoft Learn that will give you all the particular differences, but they're essentially the same because they can both create. They can both create stuff. And then viewer, the least privileged role, and the only one that role level security will apply to, all right? And I don't want to say I had a eureka moment with this one recently, but I kind of suddenly went, all right, makes more sense now, okay? Basically, you got to think of the member and contributors are their Superman roles, all right? Whatever security you've done inside in your data model doesn't matter a damn. It's a separate way of doing your security. If you want to go into maybe the more traditional way from an on-premise world of going, I create a database or a model and I put roles into my model and then everybody can only be anything other than a viewer via SSRS or whatever it is, that's like the viewer way of looking at it, okay? Where you just kind of go, I just have a model, people can run reports, I want the security to be bedded in, baked into the model, all right? So just don't forget that one. It's an easy mistake to make when you're testing your role level security, pulling the last bits of my hair out, going, why the hell is my role level security not working? And it's like, oh, God's sake, he's a contributor. <laughs> That's why it's not working, all right? Um, the least privileged, only one to use it in there. So yeah, when adding a user, what role should they be in? Absolute apply least privilege necessary. Make them all viewers, in my opinion, <laughs> all right? But then, as needed, contributors, members, admins. Obviously, we create security groups again. We don't want to do this individually, name by name going on there. Let's create security groups. This could mean you might get pushback from your IT, which is tying back into that first point of going, you need to have a little bit of cooperation between your different admin structures inside in your organization, all right? Because you need to have conversations here. But you might get pushback saying, I don't want to be adding people into my security group in there. So it could happen. We're going to have a conversation in a minute about what we could maybe do about that. That's the workspace. Then there's the workspace app. So workspaces, I should have said will get cluttered, okay? Workspaces will get cluttered, and there's no folder structure in there. They are a humongous, being frank, mess after a while of reports and models and dashboards and Excel things and everything, okay? They get cluttered. But your workspace app rides very nicely to the rescue by basically allowing you to have a sanitized view of your workspace, a very controlled, you can only see this in the workspace. If there's 100 objects in there, we're exposing you five of them, and they're the five you will see, okay? So we use the app to do that. You have one app per workspace, but we can have audience profiles within an app, okay? So this app is our preferred way of getting reports into end users, okay? Um, again, security groups to segment out your audiences. Now, Publishing an app does not give a user access to the workspace, but it does give them access to the data models within that workspace, okay? So it's kind of an awareness. I mean, I guess that makes sense. You're publishing the app. You want them to see those models in there, okay? But there's a couple of little side effects that can happen with this, which you'll see shortly. One of them is it does not give access, however, to a data set that has role-level security underneath it. Okay, so if you're going around and publishing an app 
to a bunch of users, and then that app uses role level security, they will get the whole, you can't look at this, you need role level security. So it's just another thought process around the whole, we need a security group to manage that. Which is why it's always best if there's an existing security group that kind of manages that. Like if there's a group that identifies your finance users versus your finance power users, then they're your two kind of obvious groups that you kind of go, I'm going to be leveraging everything on top of those. All right, my apps and my viewers, my workspace on my users. And then there's a thing called cross workspace access, which I, which I like. What if you have a workspace that's highly governed, so all members are by default in a viewer role, but you also want users to create their own reports? Because viewers can't create reports, right? Um, cross workspace access allows you to have a highly governed workspace allowing users to have the ability to create their own reports in a different workspace that access your highly governed workspace. So they cross over. If you get a lot of pushback on the thing I said earlier about security groups everywhere and they're kind of going, what do you mean I got to be sending in service desk requests just to get a person added onto my workspace to access my super important report? Um, this could be a compromise kind of point in there of going, right, we have the highly governed workspace. No, you're not getting stuff in there unless it's gone through an approved route. We've got our semi-governed workspace where maybe you are adding on individual users, but you have to take ownership, as in you, the business, have to take ownership of managing it yourself now, okay? There's a tenant setting that allows this, so back to the whole tenant settings review. If you had disabled cross workspace, I'd be a sorry person going, oh dear, <laughs> how am I going to solve this now, okay? So it's one of those settings you want to enable. Um, also, by default, having set up cross workspace access, a viewer in your governed workspace still can't build a report just yet. There's another little step you have to do to allow them to build that. It basically means we can end up with a setup that looks a bit like this. We can have a governed workspace Security groups, most people are viewers, maybe there's some power users who are members and contributors. Maybe we've got object level and role level security models in here. Maybe we've got full access models in here. Maybe we've got a gold set of reports that are governed and maybe we've got an app that the majority of users are people going on. That's lovely, that's highly governed. But we can also have a semi-governed workspace beside it and it's using the whole cross workspace side analysis in here to say, right, we've got Security groups as well in here, maybe named users, maybe the majority of people in here are actually members of contributors, so they can create content in this workspace, but pulling it from the other workspace over here, okay? New reports appear in there, reports from existing governed data. So that's kind of a good way of trying to maybe set up a little bit of a um, cooperation between business teams and IT, highly governed kind of teams in there, all right? Demo, finally, I'm actually going to demo demo, okay. I just hope I can remember the demo. Oh, do you know what? Uh, sorry about this. I knew I'd forgotten to do something because this is actually my first time doing this talk. So I haven't quite memorized all the steps. So that's my cheat sheet, <laughs> okay? So what I want us to do is I want us to go in here. I'm gonna go into my Power BI tenant. And I uh, first of all, I wanna click on uh, this one. Highly governed workspace. That's what it's called. What makes this highly governed and kind of managed in here? Well, a, um, the access side. It's all user groups, okay? There's not a single named user inside in here. So you add people into the user groups and they get access to what's popping up inside in here, okay? Great. I also have a semi-governed workspace in there. And if I go looking at the access settings inside in here, eh, I wouldn't say it's a mess yet, but it will be, <laughs> okay? Because I've allowed people to kind of go, sure, I'm using a few groups in there, but you know, here's me as admin, and here's a guy who's on my team, and here's my good wife, and here is a viewer access in there. So you know, um, this can get a little bit more in there. But maybe that's okay, because you're saying, right, we're deliberately accepting that this is semi-governed, you know? But now you're throwing that responsibility back onto the business team who wanted it set up in that way so that they're managing it themselves. So let's look in from Chrome profiles. First of all, I'm gonna to go to my monkey profile, which is this guy. So my monkey profile down here is a test user, okay? Um, check what he's in there, test, all right? 
And as a test user, I've got them in my members group. So they can go in and they can look at the highly governed workspace and they are a member so they can create things in my highly governed workspace in there, okay? Uh, they can also go to the semi-governed workspace and they can go in here and they can create reports. They go create reports, they'll go pick a published data set. And uh, at the top, you can see in there, I've got two data, the two data sets that are inside in my highly governed space are available to them. And they can select one of them and go, hey, I can create a report in my workspace. But they could have done that in the highly governed one in there as well, because we had allowed it. Okay, fine. What if I go to my bird user? My bird user is a lower privilege user. Okay, so bird user has access to a um, to the highly governed workspace, but the big difference in there is, of course, they don't see any data sets. They just see the reports. Okay, they can run the reports clearly. Well, I hope they can. All right, they can run the reports. Uh, the reports will run in there, but they can create no report. Now we'll go to the semi-governed workspace, and this user can kind of go, hey, I can create reports in the semi-governed workspace, thank you very much. They'll go click report, we go pick a published data set, always feels like a tongue twister when I say it. Spot the little difference? There's just one model available to them, okay? So by default, the viewer does not get build permissions from data sets from any workspace you have to explicitly give them build permissions. So it's like another step in your security deployments going on there. Are right, they got build rights in there. So this guy has build rights for one to the role level security situation in there, and they can go create a report, but you haven't heard of Darina Allen, but she was a cook in Ireland and her slide is, here's one I made earlier. So uh, yeah, like Darina Allen, here's one I made earlier. Here's the report created by that end user. For the laugh, I use the AI thing to generate but that's why it's got all those things, all right? Um, so yeah, that end user can create a report in this workspace, and that report has a report in that workspace is clearly available to anyone else who's in that workspace as well, and they can run the exact same report. Uh, so going into my SEVI governed in here, except if I go run in that same report, we'll see a slight difference, hopefully. Row level security, is enabled on one side, not that side. We'll, we'll cover role level security in a minute, all right? But the key takeaway in there is we set up a kind of a highly governed and semi-governed and given the person the ability to create reports. How do you give them that build permission? You're back into my admin situation, all right? And I am going to go to my highly governed and I'm going to go to a, um, <clears throat> my full access. So we'll, we'll look at what's done in this one. I'm going at my role level and access one in here and I manage my permissions. And if I look at my manage permissions, here's my end user user group. But over there, I have to scroll across to see it. Over there, you can see they have the build permission. All right. So I can explicitly remove the build permission. You can't do that with these other ones, with the admins and the members, which doesn't mean they're really powerful roles. <laughs> you know, those guys can do a lot of stuff inside in your workspace. All right. Um, but yeah, down at the end users in the viewer role, you can turn around and give explicit build permissions or remove it. The Lord gives it and he takes it away, all right? So yeah, if I wanted to do the same in here, I'm going to go manage and permissions on my full open access. And I would then turn around in here and I can see they're just a workspace viewer, but I can turn around and assign them the build rights in there. Okay, show the build permission. Also test users show up, right. Last bit we're going to talk about in there is the app side. So there is an app behind this. So I'm gonna go do an update on my app, and um, flick the content, flick the audience, all right? So guess what I use yet again, you're sick of hearing it, security group, all right? Over here, we have another group in here, talks, security, app group can connect to this, okay? Um, also, your workspace users can connect to it, and you can't remove that one. I could delete myself, I guess, but I can't delete the workspace users, which kind of makes sense because the workspace users can see the workspace, okay? So kind of probably wouldn't make sense if they are not to see the app. But the security app guys, yeah, they're the only ones to see the app in there. So let's see what that looks like. So I'm gonna go to my Penguin profile. So my Penguin profile has got a Zen-like Power BI experience. 
not a single workspace in sight other than their own. And if I could cut that off, it'd be great, wouldn't it? All right, but they have access to an app. They click on the app and inside in the app, they will see data and they go, oh, that's great. And then they'll click on the next one and they'll get this message. So just remember what was said earlier in there, given user access to the app does not give them access to the underlying data set if the underlying data set uses role level security. Okay, so we'll have the specific task of going, right, I have to fix that. So I got to go back into here, cancel out on that. It's this one in here that we're doing. So I'm going to go to security and uh, I'm just going, just for development, I'm just going to give it into the full access in there. I'm breaking my rules. I assigned it to actually a user assign it to talks security app because that's my security group that identifies that in there. I'm going to talk about this thin full access versus role level security in a minute. Um, there's a thin I start kind of again with my Eureka moment. I kind of realized, oh, I should do this in all models. So we're going to talk about that in a little bit. All right. But I'm going to add them in there and I'm going to save that off in there now. And now when we go back to my penguin, hopefully my penguin is happier. Demogods be with me. And you can see they're now seeing data in there. So it's just a do not forget situation. Otherwise, you'll get the unfortunate things of phone call at half five going, Mark, I can't see the report. <laughs> and I've knocked off for the day. All right. Fine. Let's go back to my PowerPoint. How are we doing on time? I got 10 minutes, just under nine minutes. Securing the data model. Um, workspace security works on an all or nothing basis. Contributors, members of the min essentially see everything. They only vary on privilege within the workspace. Viewers, we can lock them down, however. Okay? This is why I don't have many people in any role other than viewer. By default, they don't see any data sets, but they can run reports that access them. By that, I mean when a viewer goes to a work workspace, they only see reports. They don't physically see the data set, but they have access to the data set when they go running on those one of reports in there, right? You can reduce what they can see in any data set or model um, using role level security and object level security, of which we'll see a little bit of in a minute. But we also have the ability in here, using role level security, to completely remove their access from a data set. So if you want to go back to the old school way of going, I've got a server, I'm going to put security on my server, you can kind of do that by using a full access role in role level security, which says you have to be in this role to see anything in there. Again, only for viewers. This means you could use object level security and role level security to allow a single model to serve multiple users, both internally and externally. <coughs> Groups, again, pay a significant role. You'll use one group to probably identify the type of a user. So by that, I mean, if you've got one model that serves up MD, sales rep, trade and manager, customer service, You'll probably have four different AD groups for each one of those because they'll all have different slightly rights going on inside in the model. So you'd be creating a security group for each one of those roles in the first place. Okay. The optional is, as you see, when we go looking at the build, you have to have a way of association, a particular business key with a user name and password, sorry, user ID. And if that doesn't exist anywhere, sometimes we just do that in AD groups as well. Object level security, role level security. Object level security denies access to width. Okay, denies access to columns and tables. Jane can see nothing to do with cost. There is an impact on measures that use cost when you do this. Role level security, Jane can only see her part of the puzzle. Okay, you can, role, role level security can propagate to other tables. So it can, typically it's like one table to another table. You can propagate that all around the place, but expect performance to get a little bit sucky when you start doing that. So really try to, try to keep it as light as you can kind of do in there. You can have funky things like multiple role level security filters to different tables, but you have to allow for data overlaps. I probably don't have time to cover that one in, in much more. And also, be aware the impact role level security has on measures, particularly any measures that are relative to total. Okay, because it works in the context of the person looking at the role level security and they'll see a different percent. That might be good, that might be bad. Demo, got six minutes. 
quick example, setting up row level security. There's loads of blogs out there. There's loads of Microsoft Learn articles on this one, so I will be very rapid on it. The, the model is as a very simple model. I've got a table in here called access. If I go looking at the data inside in that access, I got country and I've got users. It's a challenge to find out where you'll get that from. It has to exist, all right? The other thing in here is I've got sales with country on it and I have a trivial report going on. And down here, I'm simply outputting the result of username and effective username. The fun starts when I go into modeling and I go into manage roles. And in here, I've created two roles. One is called full access. There's no filter on full access. It's just a role called full access and I've got no other filters. Anyone in this role sees everything to do with the model. In role level security, however, I can see that there's a filter set up on the access side and the access says users got to equal to username. All right, and that's pretty much role level security done, set up. Okay, ready to kind of go. You just need that username filter to be kicking in somewhere and that somehow propagates down and hides what you need to see somewhere. Object level security, you got to do via tabular editor. Okay, so inside in tabular editor, I got my two roles in here. If I go looking at full access and I look down here, I can see all oh, object level security, zero of three tables enabled on. But if I look at role level security, I can see that on object level security, that one, there's nothing on it. But if I look on sales, I can see that I've set it up for one out of three columns. And I can see in there, they do not have access to margin. Okay, so that's a, a brief whirlwind on setting up role level and object level security and what it does. Let's look at the implications of it when we do that. All right, I want to go in and open up this as me. Haven't published that. I'm very glad I'm in this spot to save a few clicks. Having created the security, you have to assign users to the security, okay? That's something you do in the service, okay? So this is where my full access role begins to kick in, okay? Because I earlier assigned that to my app user group who initially didn't have any access to the data because they don't have access to the workspace. Um, and it's role level security applied. So by doing this, it means that for all viewers, I can ensure that they cannot see any data in my data set unless I explicitly have them added to a role that gives them access to that data set. That's really important with reshare, okay? When people can share a report and then they can share a report to another person and they can share a report to another person, all of that is applying security to access the workspace as a viewer, okay? But what if they share it to a person who shouldn't have seen data, okay? So this is kind of a way of you putting in an extra level of going, I'm the developer, I know who should be seeing this data, it's been agreed, it's been signed off, I'm not, trust, I'm not trusting John over in the corner because he's going to fire it off to his 10 buddies around the company, okay? So if his 10 buddies aren't in the security group, he doesn't get to see this data. It doesn't matter what's going on in the workspace. So that was kind of useful for me to learn, I didn't know about G. <laughs> okay. um, the second one in here is the role level security role inside there, which is the more traditional, I can click onto it, I see in here, and you can test from within here. I can go test as role. I am viewing as role level security. I'm gonna connect as a person. I'm gonna connect as um, test end user. It pops up, hey, he's in an RLS role apply, and I will start seeing what that person sees in there. So a very useful way of testing it in there. Similarly, if I go in and test that as my good wife, and effective permissions, none. So that's what she gets. She does not have access to on this workspace. So quite a nice little feature in there. You can also select different reports that you can test that under if you've got a bunch of reports in there when you do that in there. Um, how to test, right, impact that it has, okay? Um, the impact that it has on that, I think I have to show this to you via typical. I didn't write down the last two steps I need to do in there. So I gotta work it out. This is, this is, this is test end user. Yes, thank you. So we're gonna go looking at test end user and we are going to go looking at um, the app. We'll go looking at the app. Suddenly I've thrown myself. It's amazing what happens when you just don't write down a step. Okay, uh, we're going to go looking at the highly governed in there. Uh, this person has role level security enabled. Okay, um, 
So what's the problem in here? See that percentage of sale? That works out for them, okay? That's his percentage of the overall sales of four million in there. But if I was to go run my app in there, uh, I am going to see a completely different situation happening when I go run in that same report, which is this one down here. Um, sorry, I clicked on the data set, not the report. It's all going wrong. It's not going wrong. I'm just nearly out of time. Whereas if I look at the same value in here, you get different percentages going on. So it works out in your context, okay? There are techniques around that. So far from what I've found in it, the technique is a pretty much you've got to create a copy of your fact table, create a relationship between it in there, hide it off, so there's another set of measures going on that they can use on it, okay? There are techniques around that one. The other one on that one is on the columnar side of things. If I go in, and I'll do that best via the test. If I go in here, um, go back in, test my role, test my role. Uh, security, 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 security. Role level security, and they were gonna go in, gonna test as a role in there, and I'm gonna go testing as my good wife again. Um, actually, I probably won't be able to show you because I've set security on this guy now, haven't I? Damn it, you're gonna have to take my word for it. What would happen in here is, if you haven't set up the role level security, I'm on time, these will show up big errors because I've denied them access to margin. You'll actually get a visual that says you cannot see this one in here. Um, I'm kind of done in time, so really apologies about kind of their little bit of run out in the end. There's my takeaway messages. Get your admin right. Use security groups. Review your tenant settings. Apply lease privilege. Find a pattern that works for your organization. Keep stick to it. Beware of the whole members and contributors are super users, really. They got super capes on. And beware side effects of role level security and object level security. And that's me. I'm done. I'll obviously stay here. You can take any questions you have and stuff like that. Thank you very much for whoever joined online, if anyone joined online. Feedback via that link. But I've noticed that people are receiving emails, so you can click on the email as well. So that's it, guys. Thank you very much for being on the talk. <laughs>